Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the San Francisco Opera. My name is David Stoll. I'm president of the Conservatory of Music. Uh, behalf on all of us at the Conservatory and for the Rubin Institute, we'd like to thank David Gockley and the entire administration of the opera for being partners with us on the Rubin Institute tonight. Uh, I will tell you a bit about the Rubin Institute before I get to, uh, to inviting our uh, quite spectacular guest speaker. Uh, the Rubin Institute, for those who may not know, is in fact an institute dedicated to music criticism. And I'm sure as all of you as opera goers and fans, if you've read Josh Cosman's reviews and others' reviews in the paper, the reality is, is that music criticism in the United States is something that is a very, very difficult task, it requires an exceptional knowledge of music, a capacity to write, and to write quickly and well, as a matter of fact. Uh, the reality is, is that the Institute is dedicated to producing writers who continue that work. That in the face of blogs and opportunities, shall we say, to react to performances, the Criticism Institute is really dedicated to providing a perspective on performances, informed discourse on the quality of what we're seeing, how it really relates to us as individuals, and how we can really think about what it was to be there that evening for that critic. Uh, this has been a fantastic uh, week. The partners in, in the Institute are uh, San Francisco Symphony, San Francisco Opera, Philharmonia Baroque, and Cal Performances. And the partner schools that designated their best students to come out are the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, Yale, Stanford, Cal, and the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And we have 17 fellows with us. Uh, these fellows are all writing reviews each night furiously and then having the top critics from across the country rip them to shreds the very next day. <laughs> which they're used to doing, so it's not a problem. Uh, the reality also is, is that we, in an effort to bring criticism to you, are running a very interesting opportunity, and that is the audience prize for the best critic. And what that is about is tonight, each one of you, following Tosca, has the opportunity to submit a review online at the San Francisco Conservatory. If you go to the conservatory website looking for Rubin Institute, you'll find a location where you too can submit a review of tonight's concert. Now in case that sounds laborious too, let me make it interesting for you. The top audience prize winner will win $1,000 at the end of the week for the best review. So in effect, uh, this is a chance to enjoy a bit of competition. And what I think you will find is that writing a review is perhaps a bit more difficult than you might imagine. So, without further ado, let me bring to the podium a person who has really defined uh, criticism in so many ways in the field of opera. Uh, Anne Majette uh, started her career early on living in Munich. Uh, she has written for Opera News and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she was the first woman to review classical music for the New York Times. Uh, she collaborated with Mr. Breslin on The King and I. Uh, Mr. Breslin, of course, 36 years, managed the tenor Luciano Pavarotti. Uh, she also now is the lead critic at the Washington Post, of course, for quite some time. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, welcome Anne Majette. This is the closest I'm ever going to get to the stage at the San Francisco Opera. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I felt like I had something of a challenge tonight because on the one hand, I'm here under the auspices of the Rubin Institute talking all week about being a critic and the profession of being a critic, and that was what I came prepared to talk about. But of course, many of you were expecting a pre-concert lecture about Tosca, and trying to put those two topics together has been actually a lot of fun. Um, I think it's particularly appropriate for Tosca since Tosca is an opera that audiences love and some critics love to hate. So it is therefore an ideal subject for a critic to talk about. Um, having said that, how can you possibly hate Tosca? Everybody loves Puccini. Um, he's the sort of ne plus ultra of opera composition, the composer that everybody still buys tickets for, a great thing for opera houses today, and the composer that a lot of contemporary um, opera composers in the United States, at least, are still trying to emulate. Um, in an era of the past when opera was the equivalent of what film now has become, I say Puccini was the Steven Spielberg of his day. Um, like Spielberg, he represented a pinnacle of well-wrought popular entertainment, and he was, of course, a consummate master of emotional manipulation, which sounds like a terribly nasty critical thing to say, but I don't mean to put down Puccini um, at all. But I think that does get to the heart of why some critics see him as a little bit down market. Um, 
His artistic aspirations were not quite those of a Richard Wagner who sought to redefine the art form. Um, not that Puccini didn't have very high standards of his own. Um, and he's certainly a master of composition. I think some of his scores are of anything underrated. But his sensibility, in some senses, is that of classic Hollywood film. Um, again, not a criticism, but uh, it gives it an air of populism that gives it an asterisk in the minds of some, uh, some listeners, um, particularly given the fact that, as the Rubin Fellows have heard a lot this week, many of us critics have heard it literally dozens of times, more times than I can count. Um, I can speak from experience about the superciliousness with which some people regard Puccini because I, when I was a teenager, falling in love with opera was very much one of those people. Um, I grew up exposed to opera, and with all things, the film of Zeffirelli's La Traviata fell madly in love with Verdi, a passion which has yet to abate. Um, suddenly there was a whole world of opera that I was desperately eager to enter. I was listening to everything I could. Um, and I really wanted to find doors into this world. This was around the time the magazine Vanity Fair relaunched. And while I was listening to all these Verdi operas, I subscribed, of course, to Vanity Fair and read an article in which it was alleged that Verdi was superior to Puccini. And being young and ignorant, I saw in this a confirmation of my prejudices. And um, I got from it, indeed, the thing that I think all readers at bottom want critics to give them, an articulation of what we already think, but based on more knowledge and better articulated. I mention this in part because the editor of Vanity Fair at that time was none other than Steve Rubin, who has so generously and farsightedly and possibly anachronistically created this institute to train new critics. Um, and I asked Steve not long ago about this, I asked Steve at dinner the other night about this long ago article, and he responded dryly, we had a whole, don't mention it again. <laughs> In other words, the article I had read dismissing Puccini was a throwaway filler piece that I should probably not have taken seriously at all. And therefore, this anecdote, rather than illustrating the power of critics to inspire the young, serves to illustrate another widely held prejudice about my field, that you cannot trust criticism. But I did not know this at the time, and I continued blithely in my Puccini is beneath me folly. And I found additional support when I read Joseph Kerman's seminal book, Opera as Drama, which is, of course, a brilliant book but which is best known in the popular mind for its dismissal of Tosca as that shabby little shocker. And at the time, for me, this was final proof. I didn't know the opera well enough to actually argue with any of the points he made. And um, in fact, his argument about Tosca's weakness hinges on the opera's very weakest link, which is act three, which is actually, spoiler alert, not very good. I believe that Puccini's publisher, Ricordi, made the same point to Puccini, um, so it's not a critic alone. Um, at that point in my life, I had not the remotest idea of becoming a critic. I regarded journalism in general, and criticism in particular, as the enemy of art and all things good and true. Um, after I graduated with a degree in the eminently practical field of classical civilization, which prepared me for a life in classical music at that time, at least insofar as it was somewhat nerdy and definitely male-dominated, I went off to Europe to be a writer and be closer to opera, and I fell in with a bunch of opera singers because in those days, we're talking 1980s, fat, happy, pre-unification West Germany, um, thousands of Americans went to West Germany every year to get jobs because that's where the work was. Um, even today, there's more opera produced on any given night in the German-speaking world than in the rest of the world combined. Um, there are around 80 opera houses in Germany alone, and all of them run year-round from September to July with a six-week vacation. The United States does not have one single opera house that runs that much. The Metropolitan is seven and a half months a year, and that's the nearest we have, um, which of course is a huge op effect on the opera world in general, which I'm gonna return to in a couple minutes. Um, when in Germany, I operatically fell in love with a tenor, and we actually lived in an attic room overlooking the rooftops of Munich while he sang and I wrote. And the rest of the time, he taught me every scrap of everything he could about opera. We spent hours playing drop the needle with his LP collection, 
And of course, I listen to him practice. Um, and I fear that it perhaps supports my view of Puccini as treacly and sentimental to say that this is, in effect, the story of my conversion to Puccini. Um, even the most stubborn of future critics will gradually lower her defenses when her boyfriend is singing low arias at her every day. Um, unfortunately, this is not a practical way to develop opera appreciation on a wider scale, um, partly because there are not that many tenors, and uh, secondly, because they tend to be kind of high maintenance. Uh, you may not actually want to take one home. <laughs> no offense to any tenors in the room. <laughs> So I learned basically by immersion and exposure that I was wrong about Tosca, first surprisingly by actually learning about it from somebody who actually knew about it. Um, and I went to see it several times. I saw the movie with Domingo. And the bottom line, as you often find with the repetition of a great score or of any great work, the music kept having new things to say to me with each successive hearing. I started appreciating the brilliance of the orchestration and of the musical narrative this shifting, lively score that's all flicked through with sunlight and pathos. But I also realized, more clearly looking back, that one reason I was initially wrong about Tosca is I was trying to force all opera to be high art. And you will enjoy some opera a whole lot more if you can lose that particular preconception. So what do I love about Tosca? And when I was thinking about how to talk to you about Tosca, what to say about Tosca, I realized that there's actually a gulf between your typical introductory pre-concert lecture opera guide approach and the way that I prepare, and that this gulf actually serves to widen the distance between the audience and the critic. Um, this is what I mean. The pre-concert lecture introduction guidebook begins with the background information that we're all supposed to know. Um, I and you and everybody are supposed to know that Tosca was based on the play by Victoria and Sardou. The play was written for Sarah Bernhardt. Like a lot of Puccini's source material, it was wild, wildly popular in its day and has been almost forgotten since. And um, the story about Bernhardt and Tosca, which many of you may know, apocryphal or otherwise, is that one night when she was preparing to commit suicide by jumping off the parapet, she looked down, she saw that the stagehands had forgotten to put anything for her to jump on, and being an actress, she jumped anyway. Um, this may be apocryphal, but it is true that she injured her leg in a jump one night, and that it never healed properly, and that eventually it had to be amputated. So she truly epitomized the visi d'arte, I live for art, of Tosca, of Tosca's famous aria. So more background, Tosca takes place in real locations around Rome. It's set over the course of about 18 hours on a day in June 1800 during the lead up to the Napoleonic Wars. The characters are the opera singer Floria Tosca, her lover who is a painter and Bonaparte supporter Mario Cavaradossi, and the evil archetypal villain Baron Scarpia who rules Rome and wants Tosca for himself. And finally, your in typical introduction ends with a couple of musical highlights, and we're good to go. Um, the only problem with this approach is I think it leaves the audience with a completely different idea of what they're going to see than I have as a critic. And what I mean is that people who are coming to opera for the first time, or for the third time, or whatever, are led to focus on composer, story, music, history. And then you go to the opera house and you see something completely different being enacted on stage. And you see a Scarpia in act two sitting in a bunker instead of the Palazzo Farnese. And then you read my review and you're reading about this beautiful music that you're trying to learn to appreciate. And you see that I'm carping about how badly it was sung. And this tends to leave a lot of people confused and even angry. Why is the critic carping? And why on earth did the director do something that was not in the score? Um, this is at the root of a fairly significant divide um, in opera these days between an audience that really is not given any reason to expect something outside the norm and stage directors and reviewers who are thinking critically and interpretively without always fully letting the audience in or bringing them along on the journey. So here's one difference in the way the critic thinks about opera. <clears throat> that goes back to my hours of playing Drop the Needle with those LPs in Germany. Um, to start to find out what speaks to you and doesn't speak to you in opera, listen not just to the music, but to the voices. This is, of course, the home turf of opera aficionados, those impassioned arguments about how the voices actually sound, debates that for some of us are endlessly delightful, all the more so because there is actually no right answer. 
Um, here's an example, Cavaradossi's first aria at the start of act one. He's working on a painting of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Mary Magdalene in the church of San Andrea del Valle, and he sings about the contrast between her blue eyes and Tosca's black eyes, Re Condit Armonia, the harmony between these different kinds of beauty. Um, I'm gonna play you a hybrid version with something for everyone. If you're new to Tosca or to opera, or planning to write a review yourself of tonight's performance, listen for the kinds of differences in the sound you may hear. And if you're an aficionado, name the singers. <laughs> Could I have the first cue? That last note was held out just a wee bit longer than it was written in the score. <laughs> Um, if this were a smaller gathering, I would now go around the room and say to everybody, describe what you just heard. What did I just play for you? What differences did you hear? How many different singers did I play? Did anything jump out at you? Obviously, it was three different tenors. Um, we're not obviously in the right space to have a discussion like that, though I hope that everybody did notice that the second singer was singing in a different language um, than the other two. Um, but I think that even having no idea who sang or having some suspicions, you see the usefulness of that exercise if you're starting to think about how to describe what you hear because immediately you have some standards of comparison. How did the first, sound, first voice sound compared to the second voice? Um, the second voice was clearly sort of softer, thinner, the first voice rounder. What words would you use? And suddenly you're on your way to a review or possibly to an argument. Um, and of course, then it's up to you to decide which one you liked better. Um, I truly gave you no wrong answers there. I was going to start with Andrea Bocelli, but my garage band program wouldn't let me use that copyright disc, so lucky you. But, but actually, when I play Bocelli in these blind tests, he, he comes off surprisingly well. I've had roomfuls of critics go, ooh, Pavarotti? <laughs> and then be really embarrassed because, of course, Bocelli is not supposed to be a singer we like because, and you, you can hear this in recordings, it's much more geared toward a microphone. Um, there's not the same kind of breath support. Um, it sounds good on record, but it wouldn't sound as powerful in the house. Um, in any case, I never get tired of this game. I can do these comparisons all night. And uh, I happen to have married somebody who is equally into it. You can notice a certain continuity in my romantic life. And uh, as I was preparing this talk, I mentioned that I was gonna do this at the dinner table and we ended up listening to 25 versions of this aria in search of the perfect Re Condit Harmonia. And I finally decreed I had heard enough, but my husband had to ride a train the next day and he kept emailing me with more and more. <laughs> he got up to 40 and I don't think we ever found the perfect one, which is probably proof that there really is no pleasing some critics. But, uh, but um, I, what I played with you, I think, are three viable contenders, and I am really torn between telling you who you were and letting everybody guess all night and come up to me. But, but I will tell you, the first one was Carlo Bergonzi, the Italian tenor, who said, people are going, yeah, yeah, we knew that, who was a kind of lumpy, dumpy figure on stage and sang with such sort of elegance and ardor and tenderness. Um, the second one, as you know if you heard the German, was Helge Roswenga, a German tenor of the mid-20th century whose sobriquet was Hitler's favorite tenor, which is why, if you haven't heard of him, that would be why. And, and the third one was Giuseppe Di Stefano, um, who was not my personal favorite, but for many of you may be your favorite, and we can argue about that at intermission, too. Um, Anyway, this shows maybe a little bit either about how a critic thinks or about how opera is like a sporting event, which is something I say all the time, because part of the thrill is hearing how a singer is gonna negotiate a given set of actions, which is after all the thrill of sports as well. Um, this is why tenors get so hung up on high notes, and that incidentally is a B flat in Reconte Harmonia. Um, it's obviously the most obvious place where an audience can also judge whether or not they've jumped the hurdle. So the other big issue I mentioned in the difference between how audiences are prepared and how I prepare is the staging. And Tosca is a particularly clear example because so much is specified in the libretto and the music. Um, the Tosca that we're gonna see tonight is I believe completely satisfactory in delivering all the promises the music makes, but there have been cases where, where this was not the case. Um, I, 
the music in Act Two sketches out a lot of the key points in the action. Um, Tosca's in Scarpia's chambers. She's given the option of saving the life of her lover by spending the night with Scarpia in this incredibly impassioned, hate-filled duet. And then she sings Visi d'Arte, which I am remiss in not playing to you, but we don't have time, so go home and listen to Callas, and you'll get the idea. Um, and, and of course, tonight, you will have a wonderful idea. And all the Renata Tabaldi fans are like really annoyed right now. <laughs> um, but the music is almost film-like in describing the moment when Tosca's eye falls on the knife on the table, or after she kills Scarpia, the moment she puts puts candles at either side of his dead body. Um, and all that is, is there, and tonight you're gonna see that all, but the, direct, the question is, should a director be bound by all of that to have to slavishly carry that out every night? And are there other ways to react to those moments in the music that are equally legitimate or legitimate or occasionally legitimate? Um, this is not an idle question, because as some of you probably know, when the director, Luke Bondi, did a Tosca of the Metropolitan Opera not long ago, um, he didn't quite follow the prescribed action, and people were up in arms. It was like a horrible violation of the work. Um, in Europe, of course, the production raised no eyebrows, because the result of all that opera happening in Europe all the time is that directors can be sure that their audiences have generally seen a whole bunch of Toscas, and they have a lot more leeway, or so they think, to play with the action. Um, it's given rise to the strain of interpretive stage direction that is called Regie Theater, Director's Theater by some, and Euro Trash by others. And uh, I think it's the most misunderstood facet of opera today. Um, I've seen some incredibly bad Regie productions with very wild scenarios, and I've seen some really and innovative ones, and I've seen a lot of really crappy traditional ones, too. And if there's one thing I would love to do as a critic, it would be to be able to bring readers along a little bit into the fun of interpretation and the kinds of revelations that can happen when a really fine creative artist, not that they're all really fine, finds a way to bring new insights to a familiar work. Um, this is particularly close to my art heart because I started writing about opera when I still lived in Germany and I saw a lot of wild and wacky productions that I didn't really understand or have a way of approaching. And it wasn't until I came back to the States and started finding what I was seeing here a little more white bread and sometimes less artistically nourishing that I began to think more critically or curiously about the, the development of stage direction and what I had seen over there. Um, as far as Regie Theater, these weird productions doing violence to the work, which is a complaint I hear a lot from, from people who say this is, this is horrible, it's, it's going against Puccini. I, uh, I cite something that the pianist Simon Bardo said to me, which is, if I run up onto the steps of the Acropolis and slit my wrists and scream, the Acropolis is going to be just fine. <laughs> I think the work of art can tolerate a whole lot of variations and weird productions without actually being damaged vitally. Um, which brings me back to the question of whether or not Tosca is a shabby little shocker and to that infamous Act Three. Um, Cavaradossi is in prison. He's brought to the top of the Castel San Angelo to await execution. He bribes the jailer to give him pen and paper to write a farewell letter to Tosca. He gets writer's block, as any critic can understand, and sings an aria instead, as few of us understand. Um, the aria is a brilliant piece of composition. Cavaradossi's remembering his and Tosca's love, and effectively he's filling in for us a part of their relationship that we, the audience, haven't actually seen their life before the crazy events of these 18 hours. Um, and as in Reconti Harmonia, he starts out kind of thinking to himself, um, but the orchestra under him is playing a distinct melody, and what happens musically is that it's actually the same thing repeated. So the tenor sings a through composed aria that never repeats, but if you listen to it, you're actually hearing two identical verses, one played just by the orchestra and one by tenor and orchestra. Um, I wanna see if we can get this on the clips, but uh, my, my CD that I have breaks the aria into three parts, so it may be a little bit choppy. But could we try that first cue? <laughs> Any guesses? Can anybody shout out? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> that was Franco Corelli in a live performance from Parma. And that track is about three minutes long. And the next track on the CD, which is live, uh, is three minutes of hysterical applause, because that is about as good as it gets. Um, 
and the applause actually drowns out Tosca's entrance, which for me marks the end of the interesting music in Act Three. You may not agree, but you have this tremendous crashing wave of reunion, and after that you have this really kind of insipid love music, um, which is part of the reason uh, Kerman describes Tosca as a shabby little shocker. He's, uh, he says the music is pallid, and he says that the fact that after Tosca commits suicide, the orchestra reprises this aria, which Tosca's never actually heard, that is dramatically cheap and trying to get a rise out of us rather than having any integrity. Um, I, I think, I give Puccini more credit than that. I think actually the reason the music is hollow, and here's a case where you can listen to, or watch what the director chooses to do. There's this moment after Tosca comes on, and these people are both hysterical. They haven't slept. Gotta go? Okay. Um, let me come elegantly to a conclusion. I, I believe that, um, that they're exhausted, and that the fact that Kavaradasi, in some productions, and watch to see whether it happens tonight, actually knows that he's going to die, figures out that he, the, he's, he is told that he's going to be executed and that it's going to be a simulated execution. And in many productions, he realizes at that moment that he's going to die. And the reason the music at that point is pallid is because he knows it's hollow and the composer knows it's hollow. My husband says I'm being fanciful, so I leave it up to you to decide. Um, I had an elegant ending about the power of criticism and particularly about the black eyes of Tosca. I'm going to talk for two more seconds about the black eyes because um, it's a... Uh, it's a key moment of the first act. Tosca keeps saying, make the eyes of the portrait black. Kavaradossi in that Reconti d'Armonia portrait is painting the Magdalene with blue eyes, and Tosca becomes very jealous and says, I want black eyes. Um, in a way, this is a portrait of criticism. We all come in with these ide fixe we have about the way things are supposed to be. Um, Tosca always returns to her fundamental biases about the color of eyes she wants. Um, and when trotted out instantly by critics or by Tosca, these biases can become annoying. And it also offers a little snapshot of the artist's reluctance at being told that he needs to change what he's doing because of somebody else's preconception. Um, that said, some directors actually have Kavaradasi change the eye color. Kavaradasi always used to put two little dots on the canvas with his brush showing a critic in that case, his girlfriend, messing up the artist's conception once again. <laughs> Thank you very much.